Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is October 20th, 2010, and my guest is Thomas Hazlitt of George Mason University. Tom, welcome back to Econ Talk. Hello. This past summer, you wrote a piece in the Financial Times arguing that the standard view of Google and Apple's business strategies misses the point. The standard view is critical of Apple for being a closed system and praises Google for its openness. Well, let's start with that standard view, and then we'll get to your critique. So what is this critique that you hear uh, the standard view that critiques Apple and Google, Apple and praises Google. Well, the uh, uh, the interesting schism uh, you, you see a lot in the tech press, where there is um, you know widespread criticism of Apple for being uh, uh, so called proprietary or closed platform, uh, and it, it's actually on multiple levels that the accusation is made in the United States. Uh, Apple only markets its iPhone for use on one of the uh, four competing networks, national networks, and um, has an exclusive uh, contract with AT&T. That seemed to be, uh, you know, an exclusive approach that uh, denies uh, the customers of the Apple products the benefits of competition. Uh, then uh, from there, of course, when you buy an Apple uh, product, in this case the iPhone, uh, you're stuck in a uh, an Apple organized world, so it's easy to go to iTunes, but it's hard to go to anywhere else uh, if you want to buy music or applications videos. for the for the for the phone. That's right. You go to the Apple App Store for your applications, and so Apple uh, uh, takes care of a lot of organization and uh, sets the rules for how the application developers. And there are a lot of developers, and they're independent. They're not owned by Apple. But they come in through Apple, and they agree to work on Apple's terms and conditions. And uh, Apple uh, takes, uh, uh, at last report, 30% uh, of the revenues generated in the App Store. And they have other deals for iTunes, uh, uh, of course, that they negotiate with the content owners. But the idea that um, many people have is that that's a uh, vertical control issue that really is uh, very derigiste. It's uh, an artifact of, a, of an old industrial age that the new wave uh, brought to us courtesy of the Internet and advanced technology is represented by a company like Google. So Google, seeing uh, the success of smartphone platforms, not just uh, Apple iPhone, of course, but the uh, very important predecessor, uh, which is the Research in Motion RIM uh, BlackBerry platform uh, and, and other competitors, uh, Google comes into the market, excuse me, uh, comes into the market with a, uh, a smartphone innovation of its own. Uh, but they only produce the software. They grab a... It's the a, Android. Well, yeah, they grab a mobile uh, operating system. Uh, they reportedly paid uh, up to $50 million for, and they tweak that, and, uh, uh, extend and revise, uh, and put that out, uh, call it Android, and uh, create uh, an ecosystem where any uh, hardware maker can grab the software, put it on their machine. Of course, they have to abide by terms and conditions, as established by Google to do that, but there is uh, a license fee that transfers without dollar payment. And Google's idea is just get market share. Get this stuff out there, make it good software, uh, make it free, and and uh, on the back end do a lot of promotion uh, to enable uh, people to get excited about this product, understand that there is an application store that they'll be able to go to, and they organize a lot of that. Uh, and in fact, Google also takes 30%. They thought that was a good number uh, on the Google application store, the Android store. And um, 
Uh, so uh, they are very laissez-faire relative to Apple about what kinds of apps get on the phone. And, uh, and who cares? You can get many different – you have lots of choices, right, if you want an Android phone. Well, you have lots of choices, meaning that uh, companies like Samsung or Motorola or um, uh, Sony Ericsson, many different manufacturers will make the phone. Uh, they are offered on, on uh, various networks from T-Mobile to Sprint to Verizon, to AT&T, uh, and um, uh, so, uh, so there are many fewer restrictions ostensibly uh, placed on, on the marketplace. Now, before we, go any further, before we go any further, Tom, do you have either an Android or an iPhone in your uh, personal collection? <laughs> yeah. Reveal, reveal your, your interest. Yeah. Yes, I, uh, I'm, I'm looking at my iPhone right oh. now. Yes. Okay, I just, I'm going to come clean. I have a... A Motorola Razor, which is sort of like carrying a, uh, I think, one of those crank phones that they used to have in the early 20th century. Where, you know, <laughs> you're talking the little horn area. Uh, when it came out, it was cutting edge. Um, maybe that's why they called it the Razor. But uh, I'm definitely, uh, I look like something of a dinosaur with its primitive keyboard, and I rarely use the internet on it. On the other hand, I do have an iPad, which I will be talking about later because my purchase of the iPad and writing about it Got me interested uh, once again in these topics, along with your article. Right. Uh, so, so you're an iPhone user. So, some would argue, I won't, but some might argue that they're you're, you're biased. You're a, you're a Mac uh, guy, and therefore you can't view this um, issue clearly. But uh, <clears throat> we'll we'll put that to the side. We'll just sort of take it. Well, I would be a funny sort of bias. I mean, I, I think the causation runs the other way. That is to say that I. Uh, I like the product, and uh, it's, there's, there's no conflict with what I'm, <laughs> what I believe about the marketplace. So I went and bought the product, but uh, I was sort of a late iPhone adopter. I got it about a year ago, yeah. and I, I, to be honest, uh, I'm not particularly excited about the applications on the iPhone. I, I like it because it's a good phone; it actually works better than other phones I've had, and I actually make voice phone calls on it. I don't know if any of your <laughs> listeners understand that application, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's quite an exciting one. It's a primitive use of a, of an you know an ex, an advanced be, technology. Be for yourself. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> so so that's the standard view. The standard view is that Apple, and I want to tweak your standard view a little bit. So one one way to state the standard view that a lot of people hold is that is that Apple, through this closed platform, is making a mistake and that Google has the better strategy. That's one way to phrase it. The other view, though, is a little more um, negative, that somehow it's anti-capitalist or anti-freedom or anti, I've heard, Hayek, Hayekian to support Apple because they have this top-down strategy. And Google's got this, as you said, ecosystem, more emergent, less controlled, uh, more out of control, which is a virtue in a Hayekian world often, not always. Um, what do you say about that? Well, it, it, it reflects, I think, a lack of, of uh, understanding of the real mega competition that's taking place and, and an underappreciation for the Crazy, uh, incredibly adaptive nature of capitalism. Uh, this is a, a standard competition between business models, and if you really dig down, you know, below the surface, uh, to, to call one open and one closed uh, puts a spin on it that uh, makes some sense. There's a certainly a germ of truth or more in saying Apple is is. Um, uh, controlling uh, certain aspects of their environment more than, than Google might. Google is playing more to the partnership aspect. But to say that that, that one is capitalist and one, one is anti-capitalist uh, just really fails to see what, what Schumpeter and, and the great uh, philosophers of capitalism have talked about in terms of creative destruction and the competition, not just between products or services, but between modes of production. And you're seeing rival structures compete in the marketplace and offer consumers value in a very innovative discovery process that, that's fascinating to watch as an observer and wonderful to participate in as a consumer. Uh, and I should also add that 
the developers who are, you know, are, are uh, another side of this are, are, you know, quite interesting, and many of them are in the tech community, and many of them have the so-called standard view of the, the situation that you've you've posed. But many others, uh, there really is quite a schism. Many others love the Apple platform. They love the coordination that is provided vertically by Apple to push its ecosystem farther and through, you know, Apple investment uh, more aggressively than others might. And in many respects, Google has learned, of course, from, from, from the Apple experience. And, and, and much of their marketing is, uh, you know, really trying to, to assert some uh, vertical coherence to, to pushing, in a coordinated sense, pushing that whole platform forward. And that, that also is delivering great value to their developers. But they've had to, you know, they've, they've had to shape that and, and give up some of that uh, laissez-faire attitude about the, you know, j- just let everybody else carry the ball. You know, one of the things we're, we're seeing here, though, too, is we're seeing the old Apple-Microsoft uh, combination, or, or rivalry, I should say, uh, play out from 25 years ago. And of course, that was a time when Apple had uh, the the killer operating system, uh, which they stole, or <clears throat> not literally, but which they did not develop themselves. They got it from Xerox. From uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, <laughs> as, as, a, as opposed to Microsoft and uh, the old DOS system, which 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 they bought for, for 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 a small fee, and then and then tweaked and developed, and and that's the way all these things go. So, uh, uh, but. Uh, 25 years ago, 1985, uh, we're talking about a world in which uh, Mac had the uh, graphical user interface. And that was, as, as we've seen over the last 25 years, that, that was the killer it was approach. It's a better product. To, 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 to operating systems. There was nothing, nothing to rival it. And in fact, uh, famously, Bill Gates... Uh, then flew to Cupertino. He had to, he had he had to go see them uh, because Apple was everything, and Microsoft wasn't even a public company in 1985. And he tried to talk Apple and Steve Jobs in particular into uh, basically going the licensing route on the operating system and taking on all the companies uh, in the uh, in the computer world as partners, essentially. You know, from Hewlett Packard to IBM and all the box makers. And in a, in, a, in a wonderful, I think it was a three-page letter that has now been uh, uh, published in, in, in some books on the matter, uh, Gates laid out uh, the, the idea that, that, that as good as Apple was in marketing its own products and, and creating innovative uh, new ideas you know, for, new, for new platforms, they could never bring, bring to bear uh, the great... Uh, uh, inventiveness of a whole market of of innovators, and he supplies names and and phone numbers for contacts at all these computer makers, saying, "Look, these people want to make products with your Apple software. Please allow them to do it." And the Gates, uh, the Microsoft motivation on this was clear. the 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 money maker at Microsoft in those early days. Uh, was n- was not the DOS operating system. It was um, uh, their their first killer application, which was the Excel spreadsheet, and it really it it really flew on the graphical user interface, and that's really what they wanted to push. And they they thought that uh, that would uh, that would be great for Microsoft to get this uh, this platform uh, on a on a on a higher plane altogether, and with more adoptions. Right? They wanted they wanted a, the larger number of desktops. The be- they were on the better. Yeah. So that their product would look sure. good and work well, and so they, 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 you know, they, it, it was not clear that that the DOS and then Windows to succeed it were going to be these huge money makers for Microsoft at that point in time. And of course, uh, when Windows did then, uh, shall we say, borrow the graphical user interface uh, from the copied. market. Yeah, they copied the look and feel. Uh, they, you know, they 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 did what they had. <laughs> Told years before they had told uh, Apple to do. Apple rejected the notion, saying, "No, uh, we don't. Uh, we don't need no stinking partners. We can do this. We have higher standards. We have uh, great ideas. We know what we're doing. We don't trust uh, companies like IBM and, and Hewlett Packard to make our 
our computers for us. So they, they did maintain vertical integrity, so to speak, and and that cost them severely. In fact, almost cost them the company, of course, because when Microsoft takes off and Windows dominates the world in the 90s, uh, Apple gets very close to the margin. and In some sense, they're actually saved by investments then from Microsoft. Uh, and now, and, and now, of course, you fast forward. And so, so it's an interesting thing. Microsoft uh, does this very decentralized system where they're just the software. Uh, uh, well, they're they're the uh, they just they have also the applications and the and the office suite, but they're they're primarily a platform in terms of the operating system, and they take on thousands of partners in the sense of opening their system uh, to uh, the computers, the boxes. Uh, underneath them, and then the all the other application software uh, programs that write on top of them, and they are uh, fanatical about taking on uh, those partners. They want to be that uh, slice of a vertical stack, and they they just they did that to perfection, uh, almost uh, in terms of uh, certainly the market success of it. So the standard view of that is of that story. The the accepted narrative is that. Apple made a marketing, a strategic blunder by failing, by staying with a closed system. They should have opened up like Microsoft because they didn't. Microsoft cleaned their clock, almost knocked them out of business, and in some sense really did. Uh, but at the last sort of minute, Apple survives and somehow, ironically, manages to not just rebound but to dominate using the same strategy that failed them before. Exactly, and so, and so here we are in 2010. You say, well, you know, Apple was right. <laughs> Maybe. Apple was right. Look at look, look at how well they're doing, and in fact, they're doing <laughs> they're well, doing incredibly well. And 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 you should kick yourself for not buying Apple in 2002. Well, it's highest valued. A few days ago, it was we we're recording this on October 20th, 2010. A few days ago, they uh, their market value was the highest of any company in uh, on the stock exchange. Correct. Yeah. Highest public valued company, and I think uh, it may still be. It went down a little bit a, a couple of days ago, but um, they're doing something right now. The, the question is whether it's a long run strategy for success. And I have to make my confession now. In 1985, I purchased a oh, what was it called? Um, a classic, a classic Mac. It could hold up to a 12 page document. It was really a spectacular machine. It really was not as powerful as the DOS, and uh, it was, IBM was its main box competitor at the time. And uh, I found the green print on the black screen that was, or the white print on the black screen that was the IBM machine, very unesthetic. And uh, Steve Jobs' uh, classic Mac appealed to me, the source of the uh, 19, classic 1984 commercial. Uh, that aired during the Super Bowl at around that time, and um, so I was one of those crazy users, of which there were very few of. So why has it been so successful? Why did it fail before? Why has it been so successful this time? And will it stay that way? A lot of people are saying, as we started this podcast, saying, "No, nope, it's working right now, but it, it's not a good strategy." Well, it's a, you know, it's a great question to ask an economist uh, because we, you know, we have two arms for a reason, and uh, you can you, you you can you can see, uh, not that you can predict, uh, you know, one uh, model over the other, but you can see that at different points in time, Apple has been very well served by this uh, what some would call a fanaticism for vertical control, and. Uh, you know, just checking the market caps. Uh, yeah, Apple's at about two hundred eighty billion dollars as we talk today. Uh, Microsoft uh, a little under two twenty billion, and uh, Google a little under two hundred. Uh, so, so yeah, in many senses, um, uh, what what almost killed Apple uh, twenty or so years ago is now allowing Apple to soar. And um, it, it has to do with the, the uh, you know, these unpredictable uh, gales of creative destruction that sweep over markets. And, and uh, sometimes the, the innovation, uh, well, in, in, in any sense, uh, in, in any epic, uh, the innovation really is, is quite unpredictable. But part of that innovation is the market structure. 
And so um, uh, what, what Apple is doing now is competing, of course, with other market structures. And, and uh, you've got Microsoft on one side, uh, and uh, the more exciting competition now is with Google. It's, it's picking up uh, what, what they would cringe to hear is the openness of Microsoft, because uh, they think that they've extended the uh, the model quite quite beyond what uh, what came from Redmond, and and you know perhaps in many senses they have, and I think that they are doing you know remarkable things with the Android platform. Uh, you have to you have to marvel at that, and they've they've made great progress, and they're very doing quickly. very well in market share now, getting companies to adopt uh, uh, their software and put that out there, and and uh, that ecosystem is off and running. But as you point out, it's it's not they're not running a charity. So why don't you talk about yeah. this the uh, this the myth aspect uh, the the romance of this uh, contrast that's really misleading. Well, yeah, what 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 you know, what's motivating this and 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 driving it. I mean, on the one set, sense it's funding this enormous ability of of Google to to very quickly uh, respond to, to uh you know, the smartphone revolution uh, in many sense uh, in senses uh, pioneered by by Apple uh, even though of course they weren't the first. Uh, but it's funding the ability of Google to, to to move so dramatically on the one side, and then and then incentivizing them to to throw their resources uh, in in uh, in the direction of these new innovations, and and that is the fact that uh, 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 Google, obviously a for-profit company and a very successful one, we just mentioned a market cap of two hundred billion dollars, a company that's uh, now twelve years old, and that's from from the very birth of it. Uh, only been public for uh, I think since 2004, uh, but um, uh, th- th- this company has developed uh, a facility that uh, is just uh, unparalleled in, in the uh, in the modern economy, and that is an ability to monetize uh, internet traffic uh, through through an extremely efficient advertising model. And Google is, is, is notoriously hungry for new applications that can drive traffic through its search engine. And so when you say that Google has an open model uh, with the Android, um, it's, we, th- we think we know what that means, but in, in terms of being philosophically or uh, uh, sort of uh, ideologically different, in, in some stark sense from, from, say, the model that is being pursued by Apple. It's, it's is curious. There sh- Tom, they're sharing. Come on. They're letting everybody <laughs> in on the party. Well, they're, they're happy on to it. share their search engine with you, but uh, they, they're not happy to, to, to share their search engine without payment on the advertiser side. So they have, they have exploited a two-sided model. We've seen many of these models before, certainly in the newspaper business or the, the broadcasting business. Uh, you build an audience and you sell the audience to advertisers. And, um, and Google, uh, with, 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 with really almost without a, a serious rival now, has figured out how to take millions of tiny transactions uh, that that involve uh, eyeballs flowing through um, uh, websites and selling those uh, those those glimpses uh, to advertisers and and summing those transactions into a 200 billion dollar market cap and uh, that's uh, you know that's remarkable it's remarkable in many respects people thought that search was uh, was was really all solved 12 years ago when google started out it wasn't interesting or on the other side that it was never going to be a good business because it couldn't be done right because uh, uh, ser- searching websites actually at that time was was problematic because of all the gaming that was going on, and um, you know, you'd search one thing, you'd end up with a bunch of uh, links to, to porn sites and so forth. Anyway, Google has uh, innovatively uh, created a franchise uh, that that allows it to be, uh, you know, utterly dominant in that sector, and then to go and and to to, to pioneer. Uh, Innovations that allow, uh, you know, allow allow new new traffic to to come by its, uh, well, to come into its uh, search platform, and to create new profits. And so that that's um, that's a wonderful dynamic as well. And so that's uh, that allows it to to look differently. As you know, Apple wants to, to to sell you an iPhone and to make money on the iPhone. I mean, the hardware, the, the physical device, and they're extending that device space. 
uh, with with these consumer um, uh, these, these almost these pantheons to consumerism uh, that uh, that pop up every year or two now uh, with 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 eye touches and iPads and and iPhones and and uh, they're going and in that the, direction and, and, and all they're the, making real money on the hardware and all the apps and the and the music well, that you then they put onto it then they they create platforms for the apps they make money on that as well but the Google approach of course is they're not in the hardware business. Uh, they're not even uh, much in the in, in the software business. Uh, they're in the, uh, the 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 services business and, and the search engine business, and all these other uh, offshoots. And there <laughs> there are over what 150 applications that uh, they um, they offer you on uh, uh, Google.com now. But they're all uh, dependent on the search, essentially all dependent on the search engine for the revenue. A massive majority of the, uh, you know, well over 90% of the, of, of the revenues are driven by search. So you're suggesting that, strangely enough, Google is like Apple. They're trying to make money. You might think that they have their business model because they're trying to do the right thing. Let everybody have access to their product and Apple's mean because they don't, they make you play by their rules. But as you point out, the reason they have those two differences, they have different strategies, they have different products they're selling, and it's really misleading to um, think of it as the good guys versus the bad guys. Yeah, well, of course, as a general as a, as a general matter, I think they are doing the right thing, and I think they're bringing value to society. Absolutely, yeah. And no, the fact I, I that love... they're being rewarded for it is uh, uh, is is uh, a very positive. Uh, uh, outcome of of the capitalist process. And, I'm, I'm thrilled. By the way, I just want to get on the record. I I have no uh, axe to grind against Google. Uh, and for example, I, I'm a very happy uh, iPad owner, but I'm glad the Androids come along. That's going to put competitive pressure on the next generation of iPads. Absolutely. I want to. I want to. Um, and 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 just a note. I mean, the Google search really. <laughs> it's phenomenal. People take it so for granted. It's I mean, phenomenal. I, like like many people, when I when I literally have something cited in a paper that's sitting on my hard drive, I will go to Google and search the web uh, to find it on my hard drive. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, a- I, sometimes I don't do it intentionally, but it just shows up there. And it, but it's it's just it's um, it, it, I mean the and, and it, it's it's taken quite a bit. It's not just an algorithm. It's not just page rank. It's not just an idea about uh, how to how to clean up search. It's uh, you know, it's a combination. Like any any successful business, it's doing absolutely everything right, <laughs> and then praying that you've hit the market timing properly. I, you know, I'm a big fan of Google, but similarly with Apple, you do have people who see them as uh, controlling on their aspect of the of the ecosystem, which is the search engine. You do hear vendors complain that that they squeeze them out, that they price uh, very rapaciously, that they make it hard to generate uh, traffic for your site unless you pay them, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're painting this as good guy, bad guy in the popular press or perception. But, of course, with both guys have – that both companies have their image issues. And these are costs that inevitably are going to be there as you try to make money. Yes, and – uh, yeah, but I mean, the challenge is faced by by a company like Google, and and it just just to to mention one range, you know, so the whole uh, environment of uh, privacy, uh, you know, it's 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 very challenging. And Google has made some, you know, just in hindsight, obvious mistakes. The uh, approach they had to Buzz just a few months ago was a disaster, and they had to quickly retrace their steps. But they have created this. Uh, this brand that's another uh, artifact of capitalism that is, is so so strongly uh, seen in this uh, new competitive environment uh, uh, amongst these online giants uh, and uh, or the the the, um, uh, the communications marketplace and the um uh the the brand that they've developed the don't be evil uh <laughs> motto that has been used internally by the firm uh from from early on 
such a high standard of ethical behavior. Don't be evil. Well, you know, Andy Grove has has mocked it, saying, "Well, you know, <laughs> what, he says Hitler didn't think he was evil either." Yeah, no, he didn't actually. <laughs> nobody, nobody sits out and says, "Let's do something evil," yeah. unless you're, you know, Doctor Evil. Yeah. Uh, who, who, of course, is a uh, is a caricature. So, uh, but but they've uh, they they really did try to take the consumer standpoint. If you were going to search, how would you like the search to work? And one of the things, of course, they did early on is they had a, a very bare search page. They didn't bombard you with banners or lots of options. You just had a very simple place to go, insert your term, they'll give you a search. And by the way, they did it very fast. The physical network that Google operates on has always been lightning speed. And and that, that is, is also delivered consumer value, enormous oh, consumer value. Incredible. You don't want to wait for all these things. So you get to use search very frequently rather than just, you know, space it out because you don't like to wait four or five seconds. So anyway, the the, the approach that they've taken uh, to build the brand and to try to live up to the brand, again, uh, more marketplace competition there. Now, a lot of people have tried to philosophize about this and say that, well, you know, we've we've gone beyond capitalism. This is something else. And in fact, the Google folks themselves uh, have have tried, uh, you know, many times to 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 make that argument. Um, but um, the more you know about <laughs> capitalism, and I, I think the more you know about Google, the more you see them as uh, uh, a vested capitalist enterprise and a very successful one. Well, I just want to comment on a couple things uh, and get your reaction. And then I want to move to a a slightly different issue. Uh, This argument that somehow because of uh, Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs' control freak nature, that somehow his top-down authoritarianism is not uh, consistent with loving freedom or or Hayek or emergent order. Uh, And by the way, there's a very interesting uh, interview out, which we'll put a link up to with John Scully, who was CEO of Apple for 10 years and uh, says he has some very nice insights into Jobs' perfectionism and probably personality. Who knows? Uh, his personality. It, it's his, uh, he's, um, he's not normal, which I think is a great blessing and um, has some costs, obviously. But he, his obsession with elegance, design, beauty, and perfection comes with a cost and it also comes with great benefits. But this idea that somehow because he's so controlling, he's not – uh, it, it's not Apple's an unfree company, or it's, to me, it's a misreading of of what Hayek had to say about competition and capitalism. Hayek was never against planning. Uh, it's the question of who plans. Uh, you, you can't sit around and hope that your company will, the products will emerge from it. You have to order folks around. And Hayek saw the competitive process as you know islands of control and planning competing with each other. And as you point out, these two ecosystem or design or strategies, whatever you want to call them between Google and Apple, uh, it's the beauty of it is, is that they're in competition with each other and other models and other ways of delivering content and, and value. And that's what competition's about. And we don't know who's going to win. Um, but the idea that you shouldn't buy Apple stuff, which I've actually seen people say, because it's, you know, it's somehow immoral because he's so controlling is a bizarre idea, you know, and it and I, I'm not quite sure where it comes from. It it comes from some of the freedom of the internet and stuff we've become accustomed to. It reminds me a little bit of on my web page, my blog page, Cafe Hayek. Uh, we have open comments there. I, I I run it with Don Boudreau, and we don't edit them, and we don't uh, we rarely rarely cut them out. If there's obscenity or people who are clearly deliberately trying to ruin the page, we've we've banned a couple people in the history of the page. We've probably cut a handful of comments in the history of the page, but otherwise it's a free-for-all. If you suggest to the people who comment there that it's my blog and I have a right to, to what is said there, they're angry. They resent that. But it's like saying, you know, in my backyard, uh, you should be free to saunter by and, and eat, eat the hot dogs I'm grilling. I, I, this idea that somehow private property um, – it belongs to every the web belongs to everybody. It, it's a nice idea, but it it's not consistent with uh, incentives or behavior or, to me, uh, good outcomes. So I just want I just want to mention that about Hayek. The other point is, and, and you, you can comment in a sec. But the other point I want to make is this seemingly uh, disastrous strategy for Apple before now turning out so well. And I think it's at least for now, 
And I think that's related to, to Jobs' control freak nature. And the quality of the products he's generating now through his pipeline, through his motivation of, of his engineers and desi- his designers mostly, um, right now, the products they're producing relative to the competition are stunningly great. The competition struggling to keep up. In the old days, it wasn't stunningly great. It was just beautiful. It wasn't stunningly great, though, and so it struggled relative to the competition. And it, There's always going to be that seesaw battle as these two models go back and forth, and there's no reason to think – Steve Jobs wouldn't thrive as the head of Google, and the head of Google wouldn't thrive as the head of, of Apple. They they are functions of their personalities, their skills, um, and the competitive environment they're in. So that's my take. And you want to react to that? Oh, that's funny. Now, yeah, you had me all the way until that very last comment about you could switch the leaders of the companies. I say you couldn't. Oh, you could no, not. No, you could not. Oh, no. okay. Yeah, no, because that would be disastrous. No, the, the coolest thing I think is... I mean, of... there's so much serendipity involved here. Well, and it has to be too. the right combination of assets at the right place at the right time. And and you can see the times change. And so <laughs> sometimes sometimes the same general combination is usually successful, and other times it's a, it's a real barrier. One of the more interesting stories that Scully tells in this interview is that at a meeting at Apple, everyone's talking, waiting for the meeting to start, and when the designers walk into the room, everybody goes silent because they're the most important people. He says at the Microsoft meeting, which he was in recently, uh, there's no designers even in the room. It's all engineers. It's a totally different mindset, a totally different strategy, totally different set of skills, totally different set of emphasis. And um, sometimes it's glorious and sometimes it's a disaster, as you say, depending on the serendipity, depending on the timing, depending on luck, but also depending on what people want and how well you can deliver it, which is always uncertain. You don't know any of those things in advance. Right. So I want want to move to a strange issue in passing, uh, and then I want to talk about a challenge to Google. Uh, But the strange issue in passing is this idea that – and I guess it comes from – it's partly created by the companies themselves – that somehow it says something about you if you buy an Apple product or a Google product or a, a Zune uh, from Microsoft, and that we are what we wear, we are what we eat, we are what we surf with, call on, listen to, et cetera. I find it extremely strange that people have an emotional reaction to Apple's business model. That somehow, I'm not, again, people wrote this on my blog recently when I wrote about the iPad, people said, I'm not going to buy their product as long as it's not compatible with Flash. That's disgusting. <laughs> you know, it could be an error, right? It could be a mistake uh, oh. that the iPad doesn't do Flash, in which yeah. case, if you don't like the device that's Flash-free, don't use it. But why would you get angry? You know, it's like saying, um, I don't like, uh, you know, I was in, a, I, I, I test drove a, a Ford uh, a Fiesta the other day. I don't like the drink holders. They're, they remind me of... Uh, of Satan, so you know it's an evil comp. I, I just don't get it. Do you have any insight into that? I find it. Yeah, well, I don't bizarre. know. I don't know what you're so curious about. I mean, come on, Russ. I mean, you know, if I tell you I drive a Corvette, you form an opinion, and uh, you know, we use we use these consumer products to signal. Uh, you know, whether it's where we live, the house we buy, the car we drive, um, you know, the clothes we wear, the, you know. I was going to say the watch we wear, but we don't wear those, any, those signals. We don't. Well, we you, to, got, yeah, you got your iPhone you got to your drive iPhone. the time, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, but, uh, no, these, these are, you know, these are accoutrements and, um, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's it's you know it's it's kind of junior high schoolish. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know I I I I know that my twelve-year-old uh, <laughs> daughter lives in the text message world, yeah. and uh, her you know the handheld device is very important to her. So I, you know, uh, I, I don't I don't think I'm, I'm signaling much to. As I said, I actually buy the iPhone for for phone calls. I was upset with the uh, previous. Uh, Phones I made and their, their inability to make phone calls. So, um, but uh, if if you think it, you know, I mean, if if you're out there and you 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 know you look at people as though that they're doing one thing or the other, uh, you know, and sending you know various signals, uh, grouping themselves socially, uh, I don't think that that you know that's again it's the adaptive nature of society. Uh, we've got new technology, but we've got the same old instincts. And uh, you know the incentive structure is the same. You want to you want to put yourself in a, in a certain world. You know, I, uh, years ago I was impressed with Thomas Sowell's knowledge and decisions. And uh, one of the things uh, I think it was 1980. And uh, one of the things that uh, it was so striking. He he uh, 
He says, you know, in any mass consumer market, the, the experts in the field despise the mass market product. So he's a, a photography buff since he was in the Marine Corps as a photographer uh, early in life and um, uh, knows a lot about photography. And he would, he would go through the, the various uh, types of cameras that you've never heard of that are just what you have to have if you're a photographer. And, of course, all the real photographers, you know, hated Kodak. And they didn't just hate it because it wasn't the camera they used. They didn't like people who used Kodaks. They thought it said something about you. They thought it was a bad company. And it had all kinds of moral tones that there would be a company out there actually producing a product for uh, millions of people who could use it easily and inexpensively. So it's a great example. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, people uh, take, uh, you know, they vest themselves, and certainly today there there are a lot of folks who are uh, knowledgeable about specific aspects uh, of this uh, exciting, evolving marketplace, and they want to take pride in the fact that they know those aspects. And um, while they they may know not know too much about you know voice over over internet technology, they they really may be an expert in um, some particular you know APIs uh, for some software they've been working on, and they they want to run that out a little bit, and uh, they they want to tell you what you know what what kind of uh, software is good and what kind of um, uh, consumer electronics device is good, and and they they're going to hang a lot on that. But that's I think that that's a very uh, social thing to do, uh, and um, you know there's there is a lot of irrationality out there. You know I I grew up in Los Angeles, and to this day I'll I'll root for the Los Angeles Dodgers, uh, e- even with great animosity for 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 the for the managers, the players, the owners, and all kinds of other things that uh, to me to me represent a a, pro- a problem in my life. Now how. Now, how I can justify being totally rational about everything and still be a sports fan, yeah, and, no, it's a... and have allegiance to it to a, <laughs> to a team that I'm, you know, highly critical of all the time. You know, it's just uh, that's just one of the things we do in society. That's a good place though to squirrel away your <clears throat> neurotic tendencies, though, <laughs> right? Better there than your car purchase or your family life. Uh, I hope you don't root for the Lakers. No, actually, I did grow up a Lakers fan, but oh. uh, when Jerry Buss bought the team, that was. Uh, the end of the road for me, and of course, that's when they became successful. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad, to, at least you know, I, I can tolerate the Dodgers. Tom, we can still be friends, but the Lakers, yeah. I, you know, that would ruin our friendship. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, moving on to a totally different, uh, slightly different, maybe a related issue, though. Uh, Chris Anderson in Wired Magazine recently wrote an article which had the bizarre title: "The Web Is Dead." Uh, I think I have that right. Uh, it's the web that's dead, but the internet's alive, if I remember correctly. And uh, those of us who, are, who don't understand that uh, exactly, what did he mean? And when, when you start to see what he means, it's pretty clear that there is something revolutionary going on in how we use uh, the Internet these days. So what was he talking about? Well, yeah, and I don't know if the thesis is that clear, but you know, and, uh, the, the parts of it uh, that make sense are, are 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 good common sense, and they really fit into our conversation. I mean, uh, uh, you know, this basic idea is that there are uh, more platforms coming at us that that are really kind of uh, one stop shopping. Uh, so you go into Self, Facebook; they're self contained. Yeah, so you're not you're not spending a lot of time browsing, hopping from site to site on the World Wide Web. You you go to Facebook, and you spend a lot of time there, and then you pop out and you you, you, you know you you know you, you you tweet and you Twitter and and you spend time there. That's and, not so um, good for Google. What's that? Is that that's is that a threatening to Google? Well, um, you know it should be because um, uh, Google wants you you know to direct you around from from one spot to the next, and when you go into the Facebook, you're you know you're leaving the world of Google. Uh, but I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't to me seem to be a terrible threat to Google and, uh, Google is certainly able to integrate into things like YouTube, either by creating the application or buying it. And, and they have, yeah. and, uh, uh, to be honest, I, I think that, uh, and, and indeed the article, uh, seems to violate the title. They say this is, this has been going on for a long time. I mean, you go back to the nineties. And the emergence of the mass market internet really comes about with the uh, the browser war, uh, Navigator, Netscape Navigator, you know, versus uh, Internet Explorer, Microsoft. That's kind of like the, that's kind of like the uh, 
re- referencing the the uh, the Thirty Years War or the, the war between the, war. the the, well, the Lancaster. <laughs> I don't know. For many of our listeners, I'm sure that's a um, uh, those names are unfamiliar. Yeah. I wonder how many people have heard of Netscape Navigator who were under the age of 25. Yeah, they were. Do- well, they were doing pretty well once, though. The uh, uh, yeah, the browser Jihad, as the U.S. Department of Justice like to call it, from a Microsoft email. But um, you know, so 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 there was this battle for dominance through the browser. And and that drove uh, massive adoption. Now, as soon as you get that, and, and in, fa- in fact, we, we thought that the browser would dominate and would control the, the Internet traffic. That's, that's uh, largely what that, um, that Justice Department. Yeah, the Department of Justice case in 1998 was about. But at the same time, uh, what, was, uh, what was developing uh, and, and putting literally tens of millions of new customers online in the United States was the emergence of America Online. Yeah, AOL. And, uh, you know, 1996 was uh, <laughs> called the year of the carpet bombing when they dropped 250 million, uh, the sign-up disks. Um, uh, you, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't go anywhere. And, uh, you couldn't go into a, what used to be called a record shop. I don't know if your younger listeners know what a record yeah. shop is without getting a sign-up disk or, a, you know, a, a, a discount department store and so forth. Anyway, um, they uh, they they took uh, you know dial up internet subscriptions up uh, to over um, 40 million households or so uh, plus or minus uh, very very quickly with the sign up disks that uh, were basically no brainer operations where you didn't have to be a techie to get online and boom you were there and you would go to the proprietary content of AOL and. Um, uh, that was the uh, what 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 became uh, what came to be criticized as the walled garden. Now AOL uh, provided that content to to give people an extra reason to sign up and to pay subscription fees to AOL, and uh, that was the prodigy business model and the the model of uh, CompuServe and some of the the very early um, online sites. But the uh, the fact was that a lot of content developed outside of AOL, certainly, and uh, in a very short space of time, they had to, quote-unquote, open up access to uh, those other sites, and uh, their their business model had to morph into something quite different, and, you know, by uh, you know, the end of the last century, they were taking people, basically, just to the web, and the walled garden just collapsed of its own weight. Now, it's a great way for AOL to uh, to bring people online, to give AOL an incentive uh, to, to make those massive investments, uh, to create the mass market Internet. And it was a great motivation for uh, the consumers on the other side to join up. But it uh, it grew into something different. What's, you know, what's not to like? That walled garden was extremely effective. And uh, new walled gardens are being created all the time. And in fact, the uh, the, the wireless world, uh, it's, it's, it's nothing new here. The, the real use of, of wireless uh, for, for mass market and data services developed in Japan, uh, 1999-2000 with Docomo, with um, uh, what, what, what is still called a walled garden uh, that the Japanese wireless operators, which uh, it, just in terms of, of data flows and revenues are the most successful data providers in the wireless world even today, but they have very, very strict rules about how the content has to come into the space and use the wireless uh, uh, facilities, the network, and the spectrum uh, to make the user experience uh, top-notch, and the the carriers tell the content providers uh, how they're going to, you know, the formats and so forth, how they're going to actually reach the customers, and then the billing is done uh, routinely by the by the cellular carrier, and and they, you know, they take uh, you know nine or ten percent of the revenues, uh, you know, from from the content providers, and and do all the billing, and that that's just that's a model that's been 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 architected by the the carriers, but uh, it, it's. Um, uh, you know, so there's a lot of vertical control, but it's highly successful. It's it's uh, and, and it's in particularly in Japan where where commute times are long, 
uh, on average, and uh, you get a lot of people who want to have their handheld sets do a lot for them in terms of access to uh, uh, entertainment and um, uh, all kinds of applications. So anyway, that 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 has pioneered, and that you know that that has now given way to other models, in, including you know the BlackBerry Rim and uh, <clears throat> the Rim BlackBerry, I should say, and, and Apple iPhone and, and the Google Android, and and uh, all the evolving um, aspects of the wireless ecosystem you see elsewhere. What's fascinating about it to me is, you know, being uh, <clears throat> old enough to remember when. IBM was the giant that everyone was afraid of. You know, they said um, IBM was going to dominate the computer world. They were dangerous. It was a big antitrust suit against them, and eventually uh, it it withered away, right? Nothing really – by the time it came to court, it was really pretty moot. Is that correct? Well, yeah, the, the IBM uh, – famous IBM antitrust case was filed on the last day of the Johnson administration in 1969 and then dropped uh, – before there, it had been to a district court. There had not been a final district court ruling, and it was dropped by the Reagan administration on January eighth, nineteen eighty-two. If memory serves correctly, roughly thirteen years later. So it's a thirteen-year case that didn't reach a you know <laughs> didn't reach an opinion yet. But Tom, you have to remember, a lot of economists got rich. Consulting well, for the, both sides. And, and that is a, an excellent social purpose for these things, and we need more litigation of this sort. So I've been out there telling Doing people, your best, file, yeah. file, file. Well, you can even think back about the Microsoft case. Well, that, was my next, that was my next example. And, yeah. and, and you, you raised it. You, know, you brought it up. Again, for some listeners, you may not know the story because you're young. But uh, at the time, everyone knew and just knew that Microsoft was going to dominate the um, computer world. Uh, they had a huge market share, and their browser, Internet Explorer, was was this gateway to this wonderful new product. And it's it would it was offensive to the uh, Justice Department and to many economists and to many commentators and observers that they had such a dominant share that they could put that browser as the default browser on their boxes uh, on their in their software that were going through other people's boxes. And uh, we had to do something about it. And now looking back on it, it seems so comically unimportant because it did not foresee the evolution of Google and, and now Apple. But now, of course, Google's the scary thing. You know, they're the 800-pound gorilla that we have to restrain. And I just assume as their market share and success continues to grow that they will be uh, the subject of, of various legal attempts to slow them down, although Apple's growing success is, yeah. is, is forestalling that at least. Yeah. yeah the... It's just the lack of imagination and – in appreciating what capitalism and that creative destructive process, uh, it's um, it's an amazing thing. Yeah, the ninety eight uh, May ninety eight, the Department of Justice files a suit against Microsoft. One of the uh, anti competitive deals, and there were only a handful that were specifically referenced, but but one one of the anti competitive deals that was allowing Microsoft to monopolize internet traffic with its browser was an exclusive between Internet Explorer and the CBS Sports online site. So, you know, <laughs> you, have, you have to sort of even scratch your head. <laughs> so at, at what point in time was the CBS Sports site actually dominating yeah. uh, anything? But uh, that, that, that was supposed to be, you know, that was supposed to be an exclusive that was going to undermine competition. I wanted to uh, point out that uh, when you bring up the IBM example, you immediately trigger a very important um, uh, evolutionary uh, idea. Back in the 1960s and 70s, no doubt IBM was uh, the computer company uh, in terms of market sales, you know, highly dominant. And the structure of that industry was highly vertically integrated. IBM uh, built those computers. They built the, you know, the frames, the software, uh, the and the components, and you know, by and large, and um, and took them out into the market. Uh, when the the desktop, you know, the microcomputer uh, comes out, uh, late seventies, early eighties, and companies are scrambling to participate, including IBM. 
they have to act rapidly, and that's why IBM did not write the DOS software but farm that out to Microsoft, and Microsoft turned it into this exceptionally uh, uh, lucrative franchise and, and, and you know, my, uh, IBM that that had pioneered the computer world lost out on the next, uh, the next round of riches. But uh, what happens is that the entire structure of the industry just spontaneously changes. And the industry becomes far more vertically disintegrated so that you have chip makers and box makers and software operating system makers and application software makers. And this vertical chain uh, comes out of the vertical integration. And that's not because of antitrust. It's not because of regulation. It's a very natural process where the, you know, the economies in the marketplace uh, demanded vertical integration at one point in time, coordinate, you know, heavy coordination. And then as the industry matured and the technologies grew more powerful, you actually got the ability for standardization of interfaces uh, to, uh, to, to, to be created uh, and for uh, coordination to exist without uh, ownership. And, and a whole ecosystem evolved out of that. And, there, you know, this is, this is even more fascinating when you come, again, fast forward to today, and you see that Apple... Is, is still, in many respects, fighting that trend. Now, Apple does uh, have a lot less vertical integration, you could argue, today than IBM did in the 60s. And Apple will buy chips and buy all kinds of component parts from the market. But they still remain very, uh, you know, vertically dominant, and so, some, some would say, you know, controlling in terms of the way they assemble those parts, and they, uh, they, they make sure that it's their purchases that... Uh, that get into the final Apple products. And so Apple's coming around, in essence, fighting that trend while using the trend, using these competitive suppliers uh, to, to continue to, um, you know, to, uh, to, to put out these new products. And, and as you say, it's the designers that get to design them, not the engineers. And that, that's, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's quite interesting. And it's certainly, it is different than many other companies like Microsoft. Uh, I think you can, you can, <laughs> You can almost tell that by just looking at their products, right? And, and the interesting thing is you can tell it by looking at the boxes their products come in. <laughs> and, and that was one of the points in the Scully interview that Jobs is obsessed with how the box looks yeah. and how it unfolds. He tells a story of in Japan, the manual was upside down when you open the box and the Japanese didn't like it. In America, it's irrelevant. Nobody cares which direction the manual is facing when you open the box. But yeah. in Japan, it matters evidently. They, they have a different – sensibility about it. It's just it's a fascinating point you're making though about the vertical changes being a natural response to the competitive environment. Um so Apple doesn't have a factory here in the United States where Apple employees manufacture their stuff, but because that's too expensive, but they will monitor that process from their suppliers very differently than than another company might. Yes. Yeah. We're we're almost out of time. I want to close with an issue we've touched on in the past, which is the regulatory environment. So the question I have is that you know this competitive process that which we're observing, we've talked about many, many different aspects of it today, uh, and I think that's one of the lessons uh, that you uh, teach so well, which is that competition in, in capitalism isn't always what you see on the surface. There's all kinds of uh, meta forces going on. So we've talked about this vertical integration issue. We've talked about uh, closed and open. We've talked about um, – all kinds of aspects of the way that firms compete in trying to do well and please their customers, given that there's competitors out there. How much of the nature of that competition do you think comes from the regulatory environment and is therefore not what we would observe in a different regulatory environment and uh, whether that's good or bad? Well, there's no there's no doubt that in many markets uh, we, we get, uh, you know, we get these regulatory interventions that – are very sticky, and I mean, if you look at the television marketplace, um, j just for example, and and how broadcasting, you know, was created uh, through the spectrum allocation process, and um, you know, has been with us uh, well sixty years now, and so that that has had a lot of effect. But I think, you know, one of the nice things about looking at um, at the internet or the network of networks, as I prefer to call it. 
you you really have uh, a largely deregulated environment where economic forces have had very wide play. And the mistakes we make are generally looking at market outcomes and seeing them as somehow either mistakenly the result of some public policy intervention, as in the case of thinking the Internet is a government project that came from DARPA, uh, which is really quite quite a, a common view that I think is, is, is quite misguided. Uh, Why? Yeah. Well, I mean, the DARPA network had had uh, you know a lot of inputs that became very useful in, in in modern networks, but the network of networks today is is all these products, all these things we've been talking about, you know, computers and chips and software and and uh, you know wireless today and so forth and so on, all these applications, and and they were not master crafted on some blueprint uh, that was developed by the Department of uh, Defense. Uh, nor, nor designed to withstand nuclear attack. By the way, hmm. um, so that you know that's that that's that's quite a vision that, that's incorrect. The the idea that uh, networks are open end to end, there's only uh, control at the edges of the network. That's um, in some sense uh, an optical illusion. There is a lot of control that takes place in the core and. Lots of integration that takes place that's uh, uh, not so visible, but very productive and very important in the network. But to the extent that the the illusion is correct, and, and a lot of it is correct, there is a there is a uh, an incentive for a lot of standardization within the the core of the network and and, and pushing innovation out uh, towards these specialized applications that everybody can use on the edge. Well. What does that mean for regulation? Well, a lot of people say, well, that means we should enforce, you know, rules like network neutrality that maintain uh, that the only kind of innovation that can take place in terms of structure has to be on the edge applications, uh, and 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 that that, that again products. is a misreading. The consumer products. When you say the edge. You mean the things that the the end, the end users content and applications yeah. that. Uh, yeah, the in essence, mass market customers have access to directly. So that um, that that also uh, just looks past the fact that there's a lot of innovation that takes place in in, in the networks themselves and in the way they're they're structured, uh, and even in the way these applications come in. The fact that uh, just for example, Google is highly integrated with with core networks in terms of how it transports its. Uh, its applications around the world, and um, and 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 the world is more productive for that. And and of course, many other edge applications have been integrating into uh, faster transit to to make their products better for end users. You know, Akamai certainly specializes in speeding up delivery, uh, allowing uh, allowing all these application providers to to avoid the the, the, the you know traffic or congestion of the internet. So you want that integration to go forward. You want competition to not only deliver products but deliver new structures and to have that experimentation available to it. And some, sometimes the experimentation is going to be vertically oriented. And that is not, you know, uh, there, 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 you know, any religion that tells you that the, you know, that that is, uh, that is a sacrilege, uh, should be reexamined. It's 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 uh, and, and and certainly categorized as, as just a religious belief. It's not it's not one founded uh, in the the actual economics of the internet, because there's a lot of integration that takes place. It's 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 quite uh, it's it's quite productive. One one just a quick example. Not, not not that I haven't given you some, including Google's integration. But uh, if you um, look at the United States today, we actually have head-to-head phone competition. That sprung up just in the last five or six years between cable operators. I'm talking about fixed, not wireless, but fixed. That uh, more than 90% of U.S. households now get to choose between two fixed operators: one the cable company, one the phone company. Well, where did the cable services come from? Well, they're voice over internet, but they're delivered on the cable modem service that is reserved for high quality, low traffic, low interference voice as sold 
by the local cable operator. So the cable operator literally carves out some of the capacity on their Internet network and saves it for their own voice service, allowing that network operator delivering the last mile service to integrate and give you, a, you know, on a discriminatory basis, because Vonage and, and Skype and, and, and other voice over Internet uh, services do not have access to this facility, deliver to the customers a high-quality product, uh, an excellent substitute for telephone-delivered uh, voice, fixed voice. And so that, that and, and that is highly competitive. There is just absolutely no doubt. I mean, we've been trying, you know, in this country for, for 25 years to get that, uh, that competition uh, uh, jump-started, and, and, and finally it's here, and people don't even care about it because why? Well, we're all moving to wireless. But, yeah. the, but the interesting thing is that competition has come into the market through that vertical structure that is highly non-neutral in terms of how you use the Internet facility or the Internet access provided by the ISP known as the cable operator. So that's, that's just one example. But uh, that, that, that kind of experimentation with, with business structure is something you do get out of a uh, healthy capitalist system, and it will not deliver on religious grounds these quote-unquote open architectures that always look the same. We did a previous podcast on this topic. You, I think we, you and I did, and we also did one on the different, giving a different perspective with uh, with Yochai Benkler, uh, which we'll put uh, links up to. But your view is that, uh, similarly to our conversation about strategy and a difficult to, difficulty of assessing which strategies are going to dominate, the idea that we can design a regulatory environment that would ensure competition is problematic, right? Well, it's certainly problematic. All these things are challenging. Uh, you know, with the structures that are in place now, um, it's, I, I think it's the, the received wisdom of those who really follow the, the way this plays is that the, the, you know, the regulators should be very circumspect as to their interventions, and they should try to be as general as possible in the competition policy they institute so that they they really need to be very careful uh, about going any farther than antitrust policy, and they should be very careful with their antitrust policy. They should be very tuned into the consumer welfare standard, and they should be very respectful of dynamic efficiencies that can uh, result uh, from from things like the browser war uh, or, or or the Google Apple war. Uh, the you know the, the the battle of the giants fighting it over fighting it out over rival business models. I mean that is just enormously productive uh, innovation that comes out of that, and we've seen it time after time after time. Uh, trying to micromanage uh, the direction of competition that 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 is what we have to uh, avoid. My guest today has been Tom Hazlitt. Tom, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thanks a lot, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.